Well, welcome to the Henry Center for Theological Understanding Scripture and Ministry Interview. Today we're with uh, Dallas Willard, the philosophy professor at uh, University of Southern California, as well as Steve Farish, who is uh, pastor of Crossword, Crossroads Church in nearby Grays Lake. So thank you for joining us today. And Steve, I'd like to ask you if you could uh, ask, talk, ask Dr. Willard our first question today. Thank you. And Dr. Willard, thank you for your lecture yesterday, which is, of course, also great privilege. posted on the uh, Henry Center website. In the course of the lecture, we all knew in advance that you're a professor of philosophy at Southern California and have been for many, many years. But you revealed in the course of it also that you're a, an ordained Southern Baptist pastor. And I wondered if you would be kind enough to give us something of your uh, story, how the Lord brought those two pieces of your life together, that background and then that... Uh, mm -hmm that career in philosophy as well. Well, certainly by no wisdom of my own, <laughs> mm -hmm. I assure you. Um, I went uh, through uh, Baptist schools, uh, three, in my undergraduate education. And when I finished at Baylor, my wife and I went back to Macon, Georgia, where she was from. And uh, we taught school, and I was assistant pastor at a... At a uh, Baptist Church there. And during that year, I decided I was almost terminally ignorant about God and the soul. And I found an awful lot of it in the Bible, but not any helpful teaching about it, beyond what you could just glean from the wording of the Scripture. And um, by that time, I knew that philosophers spent more time talking about those two things than anybody. Hmm. And so I decided to go back to graduate studies in philosophy. With, I'd had no intention of taking a degree. I just thought I would uh, spend a couple of years uh, studying uh, and then go back either into the pastorate or teaching or evangelism or something of that sort. But one thing led to another, and they were very supportive and gracious uh, there at Wisconsin. And uh, so uh, within a few years, I wound up with a PhD. And they asked me to stay the following year to teach some courses they needed taught. And I was glad to do that. And during that year, I uh, served as pastor to a couple of little churches out in the countryside that couldn't get pastors. And uh, though it was a wonderful year, and we had a really blessed time, uh, mainly at a little town called Arena, Wisconsin. I'm sort of putting my history here on the map. I don't. Uh, during that year, the Lord said to me, now, if you stay in the universities, the churches will be open to you. If you stay in the church, the universities will be closed to you. Mm -hmm. And I know it was the Lord, not just from the quality of the experience, but I was not smart enough to figure that out. And in the, late, in the middle 60s, it was still true that the church was the cultural authority, even in a very liberal place like Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, mm-hmm. But no one took the church on, even there. Uh, and I would had no idea what we were on the cusp of as far as our society mm -hmm, goes. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't very welcome to me. I, hadn't, I had no plan of, of being a university professor. But it seemed very clear that I should at least see how it went. And I more or less... Uh, just said to the Lord, well, we'll take it a year at time and see how it goes. <laughs> and so, so 45 years later. 45 years <laughs> later, here I am. I think actually, I don't mean to be self-laudatory, but things went very well. And my work in philosophy was well regarded. And the opportunities to minister, I found, were often more frequent than a pastor. Uh, 
who has to deal with the church and all of the committees and activities. Uh, but I wound up being able to speak more often than many pastors do because I didn't have to stay around and straighten it all out. <laughs> <laughs> so it has worked out, in my perception, wonderfully well. And uh, the university has been very encouraging and supportive of me. My colleagues uh, are just wonderful, and, uh, and I was able to do all the things you're supposed to do, shall we say. And uh, so uh, the, perhaps the only additional thing I found was that the kind of work that one does in philosophy, if they are following the traditional pattern, is very close to ministry work. The questions that classical philosophy, and philosophy really up until the 20th century tried to answer, basically the ones that uh, Jesus Christ provides the answers to. And so I don't, uh, I don't uh, be defensive or anything. I just, you know, I'm open to any question, any comment, and I try to communicate that spirit to the students. And um, so it has just been a wonderful thing. Now, I write more in philosophy than I do in religion, but nobody reads that. You know. <laughs> an, an internationally known philosopher is one who has a friend in Mexico and one in Belgium. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, in any case, um, I find the work very useful to me. My work in philosophy is very important for everything else I do, both at USC with the, uh, as a presence on the campus mm -hmm. and um, in my writing. Well, if I may, uh, that was actually going to be my second question, if I <laughs> could insert it here. By all means. You, your studies are more than anything else in epistemology, so how right. has that informed your writing on the spiritual disciplines, the life of God mm -hmm. and the soul of man, mm -hmm. if, I could, if I could use that yes, term that you focused term, on? Yes, that's a great, great old traditional term. I wish uh, we knew more about that topic. Mm -hmm. But it's really, uh, for example, the first book I published, and all of the books in religion that I publish basically come out of series of talks that I give. I've never really sought to publish a book in religion, um, but I talk an awful lot. And um, actually, uh, uh, Kenneth Krenzer, who has some association with this, is the one who sort of got me first to do something in writing in Christianity because hmm. um, he had heard about topics, uh, a series on discipleship. And through uh, the Christianity Today, uh, I was asked to write a little article on discipleship, which is in the appendix to the spirit of the discipline. Mm -hmm. That's the first. I had never intended to write. I mean, you, you in philosophy, and you can see how sort of far off <laughs> I was. But it was through that, and then others. The, the first book that I published is now called "Hearing God." Was called "In Search of Guidance" at the time. Was requested of me by an editor because of a series. But now, when you think about it. The heart of that book is about knowing what it's like for God to speak to you. Because that's a highly contested issue. And people do go around talking about God told me this, God told me that, God told me the other. And sometimes you wonder if you're uh, off in space somewhere with that because it really doesn't make much sense to many people. But yet there's a reality to it, and we desperately need to know when it's real and when it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is a problem yes. in the theory of knowledge. And uh, the spirit of the disciplines, which is, uh, I guess, the next in line of the religious books, that is an attempt to answer the question of classical 
philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and so on. And really, again, until the 20th century, it's an attempt to answer the question, how do you become a good person? And, of course, Christ's answer to that is, become my disciple. And then the practices of the spiritual disciplines are means that the disciple uses to become the kind of person that really everyone knows we ought to be. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was the unsolved problem of Greek civilization. Uh, Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, and all of, they knew what kind of person you should be, but they couldn't figure out how you got people like that. And that eventually defeated all of the wonderful ideas of Greek civilization until I think it was 310 BC, the Greeks who were so busy killing one another these wonderful refined people that they had to call the Romans in to keep them from killing one another. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Romans never left. <laughs> that was their way with it. Uh, but they did, put a, they did put an end to Sparta and Athens killing one another and the other city-states attacking one another. But that was the unsolved problem. That's where Christianity comes on the scene. And by the second century AD, the leading thinkers of the Greco-Roman world recognized that Jesus Christ and his people answered the questions they had been trying to answer for 800 years. And that's why in the second century there was a, really a mass conversion of intellectuals in the Greco-Roman world to Christ. And then it built from there. So there really is, you know, I often just summarize the main questions of whom human life is what is real, who's well off, who's a really good person, how do you get to be a really good person? Now those are as contemporary as today's mm -hmm, newspapers. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you don't want to hear a lecture on those now, but those are the questions that the Bible and Jesus Christ and his people through the ages have answered. And the answers that they have provided are very clearly superior to the answers of any other group of people, East or West. Now, when I say that, I always say that by saying, look, show me something different. Hmm. And I present Jesus Christ as someone who would say, if you can find a better way than what I've got, you should take it. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of person he is. He's a person wow. of truth. Now, are you able to do that in the classroom? Oh, absolutely. The only issue is relevance. See, I teach philosophy. Relevance is the key. Is, I don't go in to preach or convert people. Mm -hmm. I teach philosophy. But see, Jesus Christ is the most intelligent man who ever lived on earth. Something greater than Solomon is here. Uh, something <laughs> greater than Solomon is here, and greater than Freud, mm -hmm. and Kant, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on down the line. So it's just uh, what I have, what I do very, I, I'm very painstaking to make it clear, look, I'm ready to hear any argument and I will listen and I'm open to change. If you got it, I want it, you know. I have a question for you, uh, Dr. Willie. Unfortunately, Willard. that's not, that's no longer the general attitude at the, on the universities. Yeah. It's closed-minded. Yeah, it's closed-minded. Yeah. Well, related to this discussion is, what is truth and can we know it? And I think that the church in, in many areas, are, the church is debating to what extent we can know truth. Well, this is um, uh, one of the amusing things about our ordinary universities from the East to the West. The most common statement that is written in stone and not with spray cans on university walls is, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, that's on the wall of my philosophy building at USC, but they've let a tree grow up where you can't see it. To obscure it. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> truth is embarrassing to people now on the campus, and truth is a very simple thing. You know, your beliefs are true if what they are about is as you believe it to be. That's truth. It's very simple. Children know it. 
uh, and they know the difficulties of truth and you never have to teach them to lie because they understand truth and if you tell them something is not true and they find out they will reproach you for it you see it and uh, and you know if you say uh, Johnny did you steal the cookie and they say what is truth <laughs> You know they've been corrupted somewhere. Right? <laughs> Pilate was not wanting to know the answer to the question. He right. was trying to get off the hot seat. Mm -hmm. And he knew better. And people know what truth is. And, and actually, philosophically, what is called Tarski's definition of truth is just grass is green if and only if grass is green. Grass is green is true. That's a statement that's true if grass is green. God is love. Tarski didn't say this. God is love. That sentence is true if God is love. And so truth is very simple, but it's embarrassing because it's totally merciless. It does not adjust to anyone. I, one of the things I do because relativism is so common, but it's so thoughtless. So I challenge my students when I get on this, and now I have to talk about this in almost every class. Because you say, now why are we having this course? And you should watch the contortions that go into this, you know. And to try to get around it, well, we want to gain knowledge. And knowledge is important because it embodies truth. And truth is important because it allows us to have pleasant relationships with reality as distinct from unpleasant ones. Reality is what you run into when you're wrong. Reality is also what you can count on. So people are so embarrassed, they won't talk about truth. Research has replaced knowledge and truth. Mm -hmm. So we have research universities, right? Mm -hmm. That's the most common way of describing, oh, a research university. You don't have knowledge universities. There are no knowledge universities. You can't get a grant for knowledge you can get a grant for research. <laughs> well, this question, uh, how you answer that question, whether you think that uh, you know, a human being can know truth, yes. uh, ha would have a great impact on whether or not a human being can know God. Absolutely. And so how do, how, does, how do our answers to that question of truth affect our spiritual lives? Well, profoundly. <laughs> profoundly, and um, I'm so glad you asked that question because one of the crusades that I have been on for years and currently is uh, to help people understand uh, the difference between having knowledge of truth and just having belief. And this is a big problem for our churches because many of them have accepted the repositioning of Christian teaching outside the domain of knowledge into something called faith. Mm -hmm. Now, that's enough to make people perk up their ears. But the Bible and the tradition of Christ is not a tradition of faith if you take it as something distinct from knowledge. It's a tradition of faith embodied, surrounded in knowledge. And you just read the biblical stories. Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. That was faith. But he went out not knowing where he was going because he knew who was going with him. Right. Little David, when he goes out against Goliath, and you know everyone's saying, don't do it. And he's, he explains to them how he knows what will happen. Mm -hmm. It was his past experience. He knew that when that lion came out and when that bear came out, and he took care of them. He knew that he did not do that. And so when he went out against Goliath, he knew what he was doing. Faith environed in knowledge is what stabilizes our lives. Knowledge gives you the right and responsibility to act, to supervise action, to formulate policy and supervise its implementation and to teach. Faith does not give you any of those. Yeah. 
And now you, be, you may begin to realize what a position we've gotten ourselves into mm -hmm. in this country, mm -hmm. in our culture. Mm -hmm. Is the church basically gave knowledge, I wouldn't say just to the devil, <laughs> but actually in our traditions in America, a lot of people feel that way. Mm -hmm. But what they did was they turned it over to the secular world. And the secular world said, we can take that. And so the universities progressed, and by and large, both the private and the public universities progressed away from faith towards something they call knowledge. But the way they handled knowledge put God away, and we know where that leads from Romans 1. That's the story about what happens, and that's what has happened. Yeah. And many people, if they knew what is taught in some of our classes in our universities, they'd burn the place down. Mm. And, and all these social issues that we talk about constantly, uh, and they are legitimate issues, but they are not open to truth. See, you, diversity, for example, is something that came into the educational system hoping to enable people to have conversations. The effect of it has been to cut off conversations because each little group has backed up to itself and said, well, you know, we're diverse. So you can't attack us or you're attacking diversity and diversity is a good thing. And so everyone just shuts up. There's almost no discussion about fundamental matters now on the campus. Mm. May I shift gears a bit? Oh, <clears throat> get me out of trouble here. <laughs> no. Back to the uh, lecture you gave yesterday on the, uh, the renewing of the mind, scripture in right. spiritual transformation. Mm -hmm. And you made a, a big plea and for corporate scripture memory. Right. And one of our goals at the Henry Center is that uh, pastors would watch these interviews. And so say to those pastors who are out there watching this interview, encourage them the way that you encouraged us yesterday afternoon in corporate scriptural memory. And then one person followed up with a specific question asking, Dr. Willard, what are some practical steps we as pastors might take to lead our congregations mm -hmm. in corporate mm -hmm. spiritual memory? Mm -hmm. Well, let me just quickly relate it to the issue of transformation right. and renewing of the mind. Uh, first of all, one has to realize the human mind is pretty small. It can't take a lot of stuff and hold it, before, even at its best. So the real question is, what are we to occupy our minds with? Um, and the answer of our tradition uh, is, with the truth about God and about human life under God. So then where are we to get that? And the answer is the scriptures. Mm -hmm. right. So the point of all of this is to occupy the mind with the truth about God and about his relationship to us. And uh, one reason why I recommend Colossians 3 to people is it is such a compact and yet clear portrayal of what you do with your mind. Mm -hmm. And it starts with, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above. See, seeking those things that are above is where you put your mind. Set your affections on things above. How do you do that? You know, you don't just sort of sit and roll your eyes back in your head and that's not it. You occupy yourself with the scripture. And that's why the Joshua 1, 8 verse and Psalm 1 is so important in all of this. But again, Colossians 1, 16 just says, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you in all wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know, now, how do you do that? And the answer is, uh, well, of course you teach and you preach, you know, but it becomes an individual project of embedding the scriptures in our mind so that they are running there constantly, whatever our situation and wherever we are. 
And uh, so the way you do that is by memorization. Now you can get a lot of it just by attending good teaching. Uh, there's a lot of it in our songs. And so there are various ways you can do this. But my point that I have learned by my experience, both for myself and teaching others, is there is nothing that will replace memorization of passages of Scripture. So now if you're going to do that as a pastor, you have to get, up, get through all of the barriers that are already there in the minds of your people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to teach how to memorize, and then you had to get people to commit themselves to it, and that's where doing it together becomes so helpful and so important. Because, you know, it, it's almost true of any project. You get people into it together, and it goes better. And uh, I, I do this in retreats, and uh, I've, it, it works in a church if you will teach and lead it. But you want to have people who meet purposively to say their memory verses uh, to one another. And, you, and then you leave time for them to discuss how, how did memorization help you? Uh, you may, for a while, you may have to talk, how did you memorize? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people think they can't, and it's a really sad, uh, misleading way of thinking about it. Anyone can memorize. If they will uh, repeat, concentrate, and understand. And the repetition will mean things like this. If you memorize a passage, let's say John 14, which is a good one to start on, then you will have to rememorize it. So the repetition is not just saying it to yourself to get yourself to be able to say it. You, have to, you learn that you will have to rememorize a passage like John 14, I don't know how many times. But after a period of this, it'll be like the back of your hand because it will be in your body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you will say it without struggling because it's just there. That's where you want it. And that's the picture of the man in Joshua 1.8 who is murmuring or muttering the law day and night. It's in his mouth. His mouth is a part of his body. And you know, what's, what's interesting about our mouths is what comes out of them without thinking. And that's why we want the Scripture to be in our mouth. And that will make all the difference to us as well as to those around us. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you know, have a group. Have a memorization <coughs> party. Go on a retreat and do nothing but sit around under trees and memorize and come back and talk about it. And there are just all kinds of ways you can do this. Hmm. I mentioned uh, also a, a one, just one, I think a, a wonderful program just called the Bible Memory Association. I think it's located in St. Louis now. Um, and people can probably just Google that up and learn about their program. They've organized it. But you have to take it into your congregation and talk about it and hold it up. And it has wonderful ways of helping children and old people memorize. And I'll tell you, the difference it makes in human life is unbelievable. It's one thing to have a high view of the Scripture and to say, well, it's the Word of God. It's another thing to embody it in yourself. And that's what we want it. Mm -hmm. Uh, these kinds of, of spiritual disciplines, Bible memorization, this is not any kind of, um, uh, you know, new thing. No. <laughs> so I, I, my question for you is, has this, has this been something um, that the church has kind of always done but never, never, um, you know, central to the church's activity? Or is it something that has been lost more recently? Well, I think it has been lost. And uh, in fact, if you go back to the early, year, early, early centuries of the church, uh, in many parts of, of the uh, world where Christianity came, uh, ministers and deacons had to memorize whole books of the Bible. And we today look at Islam, where some people say 
they memorize the whole Quran. And we don't realize how much a part of that, uh, how much a part of the Judeo-Christian tradition that has been. Yeah. But um, for various reasons, I think roughly in the last uh, 75 years or less, that has dropped away. And, um, but my grandmother, who had a third grade education, as we like to say, knew her Bible so well that she could replicate large parts of it because she understood it and spent time in it. But now, you know, we've moved away from that. And I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be critical of anything, but I must say, uh, when we think about how we organize our services and we see how little in many of them, we, we actually present the Word of God, the Scriptures. Um, it's no wonder that people leave their Bibles at home and read a few lines off the screen, and that's all the Bible they get. Now, we know from statistics that most Christian homes have seven or eight Bibles, usually different versions. But uh, there used to be an old uh, preaching theme, dust on the Bible. And it's not the same to have recordings of it. Yeah. And it's not the same to see it on a screen. Uh, you need to take it in uh, the bodily form of the book. And it needs to be dear to you. You need to know where to find things on the page. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like mm -hmm. when you sh have to get a new Bible, you're lost <laughs> for two years because <laughs> the verses are at different places on the page. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, uh, like my grandmother, she could find anything. She didn't even know the, the, the uh, chapter and verse, but she knew where it was. Yeah. And that's where we need to be with the Bible. It needs to be like an appendage to our brain. And uh, we know where it is. Uh, whatever we're looking for, uh, because we're so familiar with the physical incarnation of the, of the scriptures. I think it was John Owen who said of John Bunyan, if you prick him, he bleeds Bibline. <laughs> he bleeds the Bible. <laughs> that well, Bunyan was so, yeah. uh, though relatively uneducated, so yeah. saturated with yes. the Word of God. Uh, Might it know, be said of us too? Uh, C.S. Lewis has this wonderful statement, the reason you don't need to be educated to be a Christian is because being a Christian is an education. <laughs> and that's really what he was thinking mm -hmm. about. And you know, Bunyan spent his time in jail very well. He did. And he became he a marvelous it. writer. Mm -hmm. And his command of the English language, it's that came from his studying the Bible. You know. mm. um, this question, you talked a lot about the heart yesterday mm -hmm. and you offered a, a definition of the heart in the lecture and you've written a book called The Renovation of the Heart. Mm -hmm. And again, because um, uh, in these interviews we want to um, address pastoral issues as well as other issues, I wonder how you might encourage us as pastors to preach in a way that touches the, as the old Puritans would say, the affections, mm -hmm. or really reaches mm -hmm. the heart. How might God use our preaching really to, to touch and to transform the heart into mm -hmm. increasing Christ-likeness? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the affections follow thoughts. Um, thoughts don't follow the affections in the same degree. But if you want to change people's feelings, you want to change their thoughts. And uh, now that's where the will, or the heart as I call it, becomes involved. Um, you bring people to a knowledge of Christ by bringing the gospel to them, the good news. That's thought. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's knowledge, I would say, to which it is uh, 
by the power of the Word, which is living and powerful in itself, and the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. it solicits the will to surrender to God. You have to go there first. When you have a will that is under unsurrendered to God, it is subject to all kinds of bad thinking and bad affections, bad emotions. Like I hope to talk a good bit about anger in the period to follow here. Uh, where does anger come from? Anger comes from a misunderstanding of who one is and their world and where God is and who other people are. So you have to have clear teaching uh, about God and about our soul and about how to live for Christ and who Christ was and what he's doing in the world now. Uh, and that teaching uh, can transform our affections from hate to love, from fear and anger to confidence and joy, and so on down the line. Uh, these are not actually just feelings, they're more like dispositions, like joy and love and so on, but fear and hate and so on. They, they are really dispositions of character that take over the person. But they have these terrible feelings with them. And if you, if you just try to deal with the feelings without changing the thoughts, you'll become slave to your feelings. And there's a real danger of that in religion because people are apt to go for the feelings and use that as a basis for decision without going through the mind. And that makes what we have in this country where is uh, many people come forward in meetings and you never see them again. Right. Uh, and uh, they don't become disciples uh, because they are... Paul's merciless phrase for this is, their God is their belly. Mm -hmm. uh, they're belly worshipers. And by that he means the feelings. They worship their feelings. And you don't you don't go for the feelings, you go for the clear apprehension of truth. And then that lays a basis for decision and provides the feelings that are appropriate for it that can over, overcome habits that keep you away from God. Uh, so we have to work with the content of the Word and bring it to bear as clearly as we can, as fully as we can, and you can't do that without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. But we're not waiting on the Holy Spirit. I mean, he's ready to do this. The task that we have is to speak clearly. And this goes back to the point about if we don't think of ourselves as conveying knowledge of God and reality, then we will think of ourselves as exhorting people, hoping that divine lightning is going to strike them mm. and something will happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is where we get the embarrassing position of, of pastors and teachers as motivators. Let me say something about that because I think this is one of the greatest tragedies pe presently is that we have our leaders are in the position of trying to motivate people to do things they don't want to do. And the, and the standard of success almost is how well you can get people to do this. Whereas we should be teaching in such a way that the motivation change changes because the understanding mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. If I clearly understand that the house is on fire, I don't need someone to motivate me to get out. You know, uh, if you're driving your car, you don't need someone to motivate you to turn the wheel and put on the brakes or speed up or what. It, that's knowledge. We've lost our confidence in knowledge. And then we turn to feeling. And of course, that's the source of all addiction. An addict is someone who has abandoned their will to their feelings. And they will tell you, I cannot resist. Everyone knows that you can resist. Uh, you have to find out how. You have to have a knowledge basis that will fortify your will so that you can resist. There is no addiction you can't resist unless it has moved into the area of demon possession or something of that sort and then 
you have to have ministry in a different way for that. But the main thing we need to help do for people in all areas, because it, this, the problem in religion is matched by so many things in our society. Uh, for example, abuse in families. Um, where does our epidemic in diabetes come from? Uh, and uh, now this is really dangerous but the addiction of so many people to sports. Mm -hmm. uh, where does that come from? It comes from a lack of knowledge about life. And if that knowledge is not provided, there's really no remedy. You cannot motivate people into salvation. You have to communicate truth, which is the word of the gospel. And then that, as Paul knew so well, because he had watched it work in so many situations, it is the power of God unto salvation. Unto salvation. You know, that's real power. Knowledge communicated in power is the secret to the problems, solving the problems of humanity. And we, as ministers and teachers, have the responsibility of bringing that to bear. And then we're in great opposition to a world system which denies that. So we really have to understand uh, the significance of, of this idea of knowledge and power. And uh, Paul's great statement in, uh, what is it, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, I think I've got my reference wrong here, but you'll recognize it where he says, for we war not against flesh and blood, but our weapons, the weapons of our warfare are powerful mm -hmm. to casting down strongholds that's where we as ministers must stand today in our communities and realize the dignity of our calling and that we bring something no one else can bring. Mm -hmm. The most important thing that is happening in any community is meant to be what's going on in the church. And we have to reclaim that and move back towards Amen. it. I'm good. afraid I preached a sermon to you on that one. Sorry. <laughs> well, you preached a good one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Willard, I have uh, so many things I would love to ask you. And um, one of them is, is, is that uh, I've been exposed to uh, Asian Christians in a variety yeah. of ways. Right. Um, and I find so much uh, similarity uh, in the ways in which they talk about faith. So they talk about the spiritual walk, the spiritual mm -hmm. life. Um, and um, and I, I just I want to ask you if uh, if you're just both drawing from the same source. Obviously, you are. But if we you've read also, the same book, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but if you've also had any uh, exposure to uh, to the writings of Asian Christians or uh, practice of them, you know, not really. Years ago, I was attracted by the title of Watchman Nee, the Normal Christian Life. I. And, and that's exactly why I yeah. asked you. Yeah. But by the time I had read that, I had okay. spent so much time uh, reading uh, Luther and Calvin okay. and Wesley. And, and a big man for me was Charles Finney. Uh -huh. uh, that I didn't find anything new in that. I was yeah. just, I love that title. Yes. <laughs> the Normal Christian Life. Yeah. Uh, because the normal Christian life is, is what you see in Colossians yeah. 3, 1 through 17, yeah. or in the other great passages. That's the normal Christian life. And uh, we need that reaffirmed. Mm -hmm. And that, that reaffirmation in him did help me. Mm -hmm. um, I have I've read other writings by uh, him and uh, some others. Uh, and I certainly applaud what they're saying. Circumstances have forced them to the reality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't say that I would ask for it, but probably the best thing that could happen to the American and the Western church is persecution. Mm -hmm. If we really had to pay a price it's kind of interesting on university campuses. There's a lot more people on the faculties of standard universities are Christians than you would think. 
And I assure you that if uh, the word went out that all the Christians had to show up at center campus and they were going to be shot, many of these people would show up. But they don't know how to live it in that context. Um, there's something about the press of circumstances under God. Well, it's like Jeremiah says in the Lamentations, it's a good thing to bear the yoke in your youth, <laughs> uh, to really know what it's like uh, to have only God. There's a wonderful phrase that shows up over in the Old, the Old Testament, like Psalm 16, the Lord is my portion. <laughs> What I've got is the Lord, is what that's saying. Yeah. And it's often said in the context where that's all I've got. Yeah. Now, it's a very interesting fact of church history, I believe, that the church has always done best in godly terms as well as in cultural terms when it had the least. The guys standing there on that hillside in Nazareth or Galilee, and hearing Jesus say to them, I've been given say over everything in heaven and earth. As you go, therefore, make disciples. Uh, you can almost, I mean, you put yourself inside of them. Uh, they were guys that had a sense of reality. You almost hear them leaning back and saying, yes, in the light of our recent successes in Jerusalem, hmm. we're ready to take on the world. But they did. <laughs> yeah. They did. Yeah. They actually did it. And they did it with nothing right. except the Lord. Right. Except the Lord. Yeah. And that's, I think, where we stand, you know. That's where I stand and what I do. Really, all I've got is the Lord. And if I'm the pastor of a, of a large church or a small church, that's all I've got. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what I have to count on. Mm -hmm. And I believe the truth of the matter is when we count on it, we will see the reality of the kingdom breaking forth all around us. And the reason I believe that is not just because that's what the scripture would lead you to believe, but because it actually happens. And when you look at church history, you see it happen over and over, and it's happening now in many parts of the world. Amen. Great. I think yeah. that's <laughs> time. Okay. Yeah. I, well, it's a, it's a great, uh, great place to conclude. I'm sure there's lots more we could talk about. But thank you thank so you. much. It's my so privilege, much. and I'm so pleased to be back here and get to know you and to renew my impression of tr of Trinity. <laughs> and uh, it's been several years. You're very gracious. Well, thank you all for joining us at the Henry Center.